Welcome to the France 24 debate. Tonight we'll look at the Nagorno-Karabakh situation through the eyes of the powers behind the conflict. A war has been going on since September the 27th. The death toll can only be put as an estimate. At least 600 people so far, it is estimated, have been killed. While Armenia and Azerbaijan are at loggerheads over the ownership of the enclave, there are other powers who are also taking a keen interest notably Turkey. Nagorno-Karabakh, named by the Russians in pre-Soviet times, it's always been an enclave of Armenians separated from Armenia by a mountain range. By the, but the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, uh, that saw things change, and the, the uh, enclave of mostly Armenians declaring itself independent. And of course, this uh, causing a great uh, deal of uh, chagrin for Azerbaijan. So. The demands and the declarations of independence have largely led to this conflict. Why is Recep Tayyip Erdogan then making this a key issue for his foreign policy? What exactly is Ankara's angle in the story? And can an Erdogan worldview of Turkey be achieved through conflict? We're thinking of places like Syria, Turkey's involvement there. Libya, Turkey involved again. And now Nagorno-Karabakh with uh, Erdogan coming out with the words that he stands with uh, the uh, Azerbaijanis in what he described as their holy struggle. Caught in the middle, as ever, civilians, mostly Christian Armenians, under fire in the enclave, which has been under dispute for almost as long as it has existed. Estimates say that there are 70 civilians so far who've lost their lives in the Gorno Karabakh. Let's uh, bring in our guests then to talk about uh, the issues uh, related to this story. Here in the studio, Jean de Glen. Glaniasti, who's a former French ambassador in Russia, head of research at IRIS and author of The Geopolitics of Russia. Thank you, sir, very much for joining us here in the studio. We appreciate you coming in. Joining us by Skype from Istanbul is Yusuf Erim, Turkey analyst at TRT World. Yusuf, thank you for joining us, sir. By Skype from the south of France, uh, Yavuz Baydar, editor-in-chief of Aval News. Thank you for joining us. And also joining us by Skype from Yerevan, we have Richard uh, Girigosian, who's the director of the Regional Studies Center. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll uh, start the debate uh, here in the studio uh, with uh, Jean uh, de Gliansky. Uh, thank you, sir, for being with us. Uh, the situation as you see it now, a ceasefire not being observed. Did that come as any surprise to you that the ceasefire declared at the weekend hasn't held? Well, I wouldn't say that the ceasefire is not observed, it is half observed. Half observed. Because uh, the bombing goes on, but as far as I understand, there's no, bat no more battles <clears throat> on the field. So it's half a success or half a failure, but it's already something. Perhaps at this moment, <laughs> there's a renewal of the struggle on the field, but I, I don't know. That's the first point. Second, I think, uh, of course, for uh, Azerbaijan, it was very important to, to, uh, to gain some advantage before accepting the ceasefire. And the question is whether uh, the Azerbaijanis president deems enough the gain on the field to accept the ceasefire. I would like to underline a third point. I think we are, uh, we are in front of a problem which we, I, I would say, everlasting problems. That is the struggle, the contradiction between the principle of integrity of a state, uh, the respect of its sovereignty, Azerbaijan, and the right for people to, to for self-determination. And this contradiction had never been solved in history unless by, uh, I mean, exerting the, the pure balance of power. And uh, you have this problem in uh, Crimea, for instance. You had this problem in Kosovo. And now you have, and you had already, this in Karabakh. We um, debated this very issue last week oh, yeah. and tried to find a solution here in the studio, and of course we couldn't. <laughs> if you can't find solutions in the diplomatic circles, then what chance have you got in a TV studio? But we tried to do that, and it was a very lively, as you'd expect, uh, debate uh, here on France 24. So we tried to deal with that. Tonight, let's try and turn our, our minds to sort of working out why things are happening behind the scenes the way they are, and maybe whether there's someone who's actually pulling the strings behind the scenes who can perhaps negotiate and push this towards some kind of, this, of, a, of a resolution. Uh, Jean de Gliniasti here in the studio. Uh, let's go first to Istanbul to Yusuf Erem, who's the Turkey analyst at TRT World. Yusuf, uh, thanks for being with us. Um, the, the half 
observed, according to Jean Hune's studio, ceasefire. Would you agree with that, or do you think that basically it's broken down completely? I would say it's broken down completely. And uh, actually, I don't agree uh, with you saying that uh, there isn't a solution. There, there's been many solutions. Or when Security Council resolutions, two UNGA resolutions, and three OSC Minsk Group resolutions. These are all solutions that actually France played a very big role in. But unfortunately, uh, these re resolutions never became realities on the ground. And uh, all these resolutions say the withdrawal of Armenian troops from Azerbaijani territory and uh, restoring that land back to Azerbaijan, which is a very simple resolution when we're talking about an occupation. Now, back to the current fighting. Uh, unfortunately, while there aren't troops clashing on the ground, as the honorable ambassador has said, there's still a lot of bombing, and this bombing is expanding past the area of conflict, past the border regions, deeper and deeper into Azerbaijan, into areas like Ganja, the second biggest city in Azerbaijan. And uh, this is actually much more detrimental uh, than a border clash where you have soldiers clashing. Now you have civilians dying. And uh, this is a very, very terrible situation that needs to be remedied very quick. And uh, is a ceasefire a solution? No, it's not. We've seen previous ceasefires in 94, in the early 2000s, 2010, 2014, 2016, 2018, and all the ceasefire does is refreeze the conflict until the next round of fighting. So we need to rip off this Band-Aid, stop treating the symptom, and treat the ail and cure the ailment, which is occupation. And until that happens, any type of ceasefire will just be a temporary solution. Yusuf, thank you very much indeed. I'm left with the thought that one man's occupation could be another man's liberation. Let's go to Yerevan for a, a thought from Richard uh, Giragosian. I hope I pronounced your, your name correctly, sir. I apologise if I'm not. Uh, director of the Regional Studies Centre there. In terms of what you're hearing and what you're seeing coming from uh, on the ground in the Gorno Karabakh, uh, what is the situation as you read it? Well, unfortunately, after a 10-hour meeting in Moscow, we saw Azerbaijan and Turkey refusing to abide to the ceasefire. In fact, the ceasefire itself lasted a mere three hours. We also see a series of continued escalating attacks. And in many ways, unfortunately, Turkey has emerged as a primary actor in terms of sharing the blame and the burden of a rather destructive approach against the ceasefire. I think in reality, given the scale and scope of these attacks and the fighting, what's most apparent is an imperative for an immediate urgent ceasefire in order to then return to negotiations, which should and must continue. There is no military solution to this conflict. But I do think this is part of a broader trend. Turkey is asserting itself in the Eastern Mediterranean, Syria, Libya, and now the Caucasus. What's coming, however, is a looming, lingering collision course between Russia and Turkey. And this is where the real risk and danger lies. Thank you so very much indeed, Richard uh, Girigosian there from the Regional Studies Centre in uh, Yerevan. Uh, our next guest, Yavuz Beda, editor-in-chief of Aval News, joining us uh, from uh, a location in the south of France. Sir, thanks for being with us. Uh, we've heard there from Richard Girigosian, uh, really the, the nub and, and the central focal point of this debate, the role really that Turkey uh, is now playing. Um, this role that Turkey is playing, do you view it as a dangerous one in what's happening in the Gorno karabakh Yes. As things stand right now, the Turkey is the wild card in the, in the, at the epicenter of this conflict, uh, which is now evolving or snowballing towards a slow, slow mo to solution. Uh, uh, I think the main actor is Russia, as expected. Uh, some of the, the devolution of, of the process uh, left from France to Russia and uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan are on the table. I don't see any reason for concern about the ceasefire. I would more focus on, on the wild card and uh, what would trigger further clashes and further um, uh, undermining of the, of the process, which will be a slow motion process, as I said, and it will take some time. And then sooner or later, we will see a Russian 
so-called Lavrov plan being implemented. Neither side has the luxury of continuing ad infinitum this, this conflict. But uh, regarding Turkey, of course, it is a wild card, and it should be seen, as, as Richard uh, pointed out, uh, in a bigger context, larger regional context. Turkey is uh, trying to make use of the vacuums and disruptions in around uh, uh, and region uh, in its foreign policy search, which is more than assertive, which is sort of, uh, uh, which has lots of elements of irredentism or expansionism, but in a, each and every clash or, or encounter in its search for foreign policy opening, if you will, it has met a wall. Uh, in Syria, it has met the wall of Russia. In Eastern Mediterranean, it has met the wall of a unified increasingly unified European Union. In Libya, again, it has met the wall of Egypt and, and Russia. And Caucasus now leaves Turkey also uh, in empty-ended because it is there, but it wants to be a player. But Russia yesterday denied categorically Azerbaijani demands of having Turkey on at the table. It's, it's uh, also uh, uh, part of the Turkish domestic policy to play on the Azeri card, Azerbaijani card, but the tools that Turkey used in, in the intervention in the conflict, per se, through the jihadists, which is whose existence is, are, is, are, is a fact now, These are is making mercenaries, yes? even more difficult. Jihadist mercenaries, yes, uh, hundreds of them. And uh, I keep in mind the fact that Putin and Erdogan has not spoken to each other since 17th of August. As uh, Russians are very angry with, with the Turkish power structure, topped by Erdogan, and uh, we see signs and says, you know, signs of it in the Russian media every day now, increasing anger. And uh, I think uh, Richard may be right in, in, in guessing that there, it's leading to a sort of a clash situation between Moscow and Ankara. Thank you, sir, very much indeed. Uh, Yavuz uh, Ubaidah there. Uh, Yusuf, I will come to you in a second. I've just got a quick comment from the uh, former French ambassador to Russia, Jean de Gliniasti, uh, here in the studio. Uh, we're hearing there about the role that Russia is playing. Um, it's tempting to look at what's going on and think that Turkey is playing a far more dominant role in what's happening. What is Putin's game, do you think? Well, the Russians had a choice. They could have negotiated with Turkey and try to find an agreement, or they could rely on the Minsk group, that is to say, using France and uh, the United States to put some pressure on Turkey. And obviously, they chose the second way. So now, as uh, our uh, participants said, uh, I think Turkey will face a wall sooner or later. But remains the fact that uh, um, you need to save the face of Azerbaijan. Um, now you have 20% of its territory, which is occupied by the Armenian. And so I think before negotiating some lasting solution, Azerbaijan needs to gain some results on the field. It is puzzling to think how the situations occurred. We have a country, then an enclave within the country, which is occupied by people who are basically from a neighboring country. And it's clear to see that this can ov obviously provoke big issues. Yes. Um, but, you know, they can be content with uh, just taking back the, uh, the crown, the buffer zone, which is specifically Azerbaijanese. The, uh, the Nagorno Karabakh is. Um, the population of Nagorno-Karabakh is purely Armenian. But the buffer zone was conquered by the Armenians and they are populated by, uh, they were, because they have been expelled, most of them, but they are populated by, by Azeris, by Azerbaijanis. So I think you have some kind of legitimacy to try to regain this type of territory. 
Jean, thank you very much indeed. Let's bring in uh, Youssef Erem in Istanbul for a response. Uh, Youssef, uh, thanks for joining us again from TRT World <coughs> Turkey Analyst there. Uh, you were saying earlier that there are and there have been resolutions to, to, to clear, clarify the issue, to bring about peace, but nothing seems to be working. And while pronouncements are made both in Ankara uh, and in Moscow and in other world capitals about the situation, there are civilians who are under fire in Nagorno-Karabakh. How can you resolve the situation, do you think? Well, as I said, there are very good resolutions in place, but unfortunately, uh, Armenia does not want to give up this territory. And just to add to what the ambassador said, where he, he said that the population of Nagorno-Karabakh is uh, completely Armenian, we have to realize that in, between 1998, uh, between 1988 and 1994, during the Six-Year War, one million Armenians, one million Azerbaijanis were displaced during that war from the Nagorno-Karabakh region and the seven surrounding territories. So uh, it was very it was an area that was very heavily populated by Azerbaijanis. It's an area that has been historically uh, part of Azerbaijan, dating back to the 19, 1923 decision by Joseph Stalin, dating back to the decision by the Soviets in 1988. Putin again reaffirmed this in 2016 and earlier this year, uh, in 2020. So uh, we've seen many decisions by the Soviets throughout saying Nagorno-Karabakh is Azerbaijan's. Now, Back to uh, the current conflict on the ground, expanding this conflict beyond the border is extremely dangerous because this risks all-out war, and all-out war is going to draw in international actors. Now, you hear a lot about Turkey, but Yusuf, Yusuf, I'm sorry, I need, uh, Yusuf, I need to stop you. We have a technical issue. We're not hearing everything that you're saying, and I, I sense that what you're saying is extremely interesting. This comes at a good time because we have a very short break. We will try to re-establish the link with you, Yusuf, to make sure it's clearer and we can hear all your words uh, when we come back for part two of the France Vincat debate. Please stay with us. Welcome back to part two of the France 24 debate. We're discussing the situation in the Gorno Karabakh, where the ceasefire declared at the weekend, negotiated by Moscow, just isn't sticking. One of our guests saying it's halfway there. Others saying no way. The fighting continues. It hasn't worked at all. There are a number of reasons why that's happened. We're discussing that too. Also, we're looking at the role that other players are playing within that conflict, notably Turkey, with its. Uh, decision to stand, well, side by side uh, with uh, Azerbaijan. And I'll read you a quotation from Recep Tayyip Erdogan, president of Turkey from October the 5th. We say again to our Azerbaijani brothers that we stand by them in their holy struggle until victory. We'll be getting some comments on that and other issues uh, related to the situation in the Gorno Karabakh as we go through this second part of our debate. Let me introduce you to our guests here in the studio, Jean uh, de Gliasti, who is a former French ambassador to Russia, head of research at Iris and author of Geopolitics of Russia. Thank you, sir, for being with us here in the studio. Our guests from afar, in no order of preference, they are all equally welcome here in this program. By Skype from Istanbul, Yusuf Erim, who is a Turkey analyst at TRT World. Uh, joining us by Skype is Yavuz Beda, editor-in-chief of Aval News, and by Skype from Yerevan, Richard uh, Girigosian, who is director of the Regional Studies Centre there, joining us uh, from uh, Yerevan. We ended part one uh, quite abruptly, sadly, because we were having problems with Yusuf Erin and the link to him uh, from Istanbul. Yusuf, I'll come back to you in the hope, fingers crossed, that the link is OK and we can hear you clearly, sir. You were telling us, uh, we were talking about why things aren't working, uh, but can I actually sort of come past that and ask you to comment on that quotation I read out from Recep Tayyip Erdogan. We say again to our Azer Azerbaijani brothers that we stand with them in their holy struggle until victory. Holy struggle. Well, holy struggle meaning the homeland. A uh, homeland of any country is holy soil. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, people die defending this land and this land is occupied right now and this is a holy venture to take this back. I don't think that it has any type of religious connotations uh, at the end of the day. Uh, anyone's home is holy to them, and Azerbaijan's home is holy to them. But I want to get back to the Turkey side a little. Please do. What Please I was do. mentioning before the table. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I want to say is a lot of, uh, a lot of attention is being paid to Turkey 
And we have to realize that its borders being stable, stabilized right now. And just like any country in the world, they will pay close attention to any time, any time there's destabilization on the border. So it's only natural that Turkey is very interested in what's going on in Azerbaijan and uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And as for Russia's relationship with Turkey, it's still strong. Uh, we're going to see in the future that Erdogan and Putin will be meeting a lot because we're seeing a lot of destabilization in the post-Soviet space, whether it be Crimea, uh, Ukraine, uh, Ossetia, Abazia, uh, Georgia, now Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, anytime you have this destabilization in the post-Soviet space, especially the Caucasus, we're talking about Muslims. We're talking about Turkic people. So Turkey will be playing a role Anytime this happens in this region, and this is something that Moscow is going to have to get used to, whether they like it or not. Now, Syria was national security for Turkey. Libya is national interest for Turkey. But Azerbaijan is very, very different. Azerbaijan is brethren. When every, every Turkish household knows that Azerbaijan has friends with Azerbaijan. So this is much different than the previous conflicts that Turkey took part in. Yusuf Erem, thank you very much uh, indeed. Let's uh, bring in uh, from Yerevan, uh, Richard Girigosian, Director of the Regional Studies Centre there in uh, Armenia for more comments on this. Uh, Richard, the uh, line from uh, Erdogan, I'll put it to you about this idea of the holy struggle. <laughs> yes, I can, I can see what Yusuf is saying about this, referring to basically the homeland, the soil, uh, defending uh, one's place. <coughs> but is there a, a bigger issue here from Recep Tayyip Erdogan in terms of trying to project... Turkey project himself further on the world stage? Well, yes, the bigger issue in many ways is what's new and what's different about the current situation. And there are three specific drivers or factors making this much more serious and much more deadly. First is Turkey is much more active and much more engaged militarily in supporting operations by the Azerbaijani army. This is new. It's fairly unprecedented, and it's much more dynamic than what Russia has been doing. Secondly, Russia has been uncharacteristically passive in this recent two weeks of clashes. And in many ways, we have to remember what's different here. This issue, Nagorno-Karabakh, is the only conflict, the only issue where Russia remains working with the West and not against the West. France and the United States are co-chairs with Russia. This is a unique opportunity to actually reward good behavior by Putin's Russia. And there are diplomatic dividends to allowing a Russian diplomatic initiative. And what's also important here is a third new development, the victory, a rare victory of nonviolent democratic change in Armenia, where we finally have a real democracy in Armenia, which gives us some ground for optimism, whether it's overcoming this burden of conflict, returning to diplomacy, but more importantly, preventing or mitigating the real risk. The risk is a clash of titans between two men, rather authoritarian, strong personalities, Erdogan and Putin. And Turkey is in danger of becoming overextended. And there will be a, a resulting price to pay for such reckless intervention in the South Caucasus with Russia, but also with the dangerously overconfident Azerbaijan. That's why my focus and imperative is much more concern for the loss of life in all parties to this conflict. We need an emergency, urgency, and immediate ceasefire in order to return to diplomacy, which is the only way forward for everyone. A message loud and clear, Richard Girigossian there from the Regional Studies Centre in Yerevan. Immediate ceasefire needed concern for all lives, not just Armenian lives, not just Armenian uh, Karabakh lives, not just Azeri lives, but all lives concerned. And that message, Richard, loud and clear. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's bring in uh, Yavuz Beydar uh, of Aval News uh, for further comment uh, on, on this one. Um, the idea, perhaps, that Erdogan may be overreaching, uh, the idea, certainly, that he's trying to project himself and Turkey as a main player 
uh, on the world stage, not just a regional player, but as a main player, as uh, as Youssef was saying, different interests that Turkey has, reaching into different areas, Syria, Libya, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh, standing with the uh, Azerbaijani brothers, as Erdogan put it. Well, uh, there are points to be made there. First, let's begin with Erdogan's remarks uh, that uh, you, you cited. Uh, I think one point should not go missed, which is Turkey is the only pro-war uh, power structure in the region in terms of uh, looking at approaching the crisis, a spotty crisis here and there. And the same uh, language was used again regarding the Caucasus, the, the crisis in Caucasus. Whereas each, every other nation, every other state was uh, sort of calling for ceasefire and peace process, uh, urging for uh, further talks and negotiations. That leaves Turkey out, as, as I said, as a wild card. Second, I think uh, there is a paradox here. As you, you know, pointed out, Turkey is flexing its muscles, trying to expand into beyond its borders in the region to be a major player. But the paradox is with this rapidly declining uh, economy, uh, you cannot claim uh, a military uh, gains or, or diplomatic gains. Uh, as we see, uh, you know, hitting wall after wall in, in the region leaves uh, uh, the power structure in Ankara. I call it power structure. I don't call it Turkey because in Ankara, there is the power structure of President Erdogan in his political ally, ultranationalist Devlet Bahçeli. And the, the, there are three points to be made there. Uh, rationale of the, of the new foreign policy ever since the botched coup and the language and the tools that are, that are used or methodology. The uh, rationale is is a blend of uh, a, a autocratic structure, which is now taking everything in it as a hostage in Ankara, in political uh, sphere, as well as judiciary. And it is blended with a blended ideology of nationalism, a aggressive, offensive nationalism, let's say, and, and Islamism. And that is per se a... a, a producing a foreign policy which will by which will have to be militarized in its language that's why we hear all the time this militarized language uh, towards uh, greece towards cyprus towards egypt towards libya towards syria etc etc and the tools yes turkey is one of the most powerful armies in turkey in, in, in the world and with nato and the tools are that are that that can be used of course create a lot of anxiety uh, in the neighborhood, but the tools that are used in many places, such as Syria and now we see as Caucasus, is the exportation and uh, transfer of uh, jihadist mercenaries as, as, as the main element uh, in that. And it is, of course, creating a lot of uh, uh, anger, as we say, as we see, see in, in Caucasus. And it's also a loser. I mean, it's a no-brainer, perhaps, you would say, because as, if you transfer uh, mercenaries, in, in, you know, Sunni mercenaries to mainly Shia uh, Azerbaijan, you are basically uh, challenging something which is unchallengeable. So uh, that is uh, uh, the erratic mindset that is uh, defining and describing uh, the power structure in Ankara right now. That's why we see now all these... Uh, constellations taking place, such as Arab League, unit mon in a monoblock taking a stand against Turkey now, which is very, very unusual. And the Arab League recently issued uh, a statement saying, calling for urgent pullout of Iraq and Syria. Uh, we saw what happened in Eastern Mediterranean, uh, although uh, in, in, in beginning hesitant, uh, European Union now stands unified. Uh, mainly because of the French push for 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 protecting the European Union territories, because French are also occupied, uh, the, the concerned about setting this as a precedent for for Baltic states uh, for for Russia. They, they, it's all it's all strategy, and also as we saw in Libya, uh, Egypt and Russia, uh, you know, got, got together to 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 block uh, Turkish expansionism there. So this is a. Not a not so very successful foreign policy because it is militarized. It is uh, trying to uh, 
drive a wedge within current status quo, uh, trying to make usage of COVID because each and every nation is now occupied uh, with, with, with you know, COVID spread and also American elections. And I think Ankara mindset is seeing a lot of vacuums there and trying to take advantage of it, but so far, not so successfully. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any... I, or see any success in the future for, for such a militarized premise. Yavis, thank you very much indeed. I'll get a comment from Jean about the United States' uh, absence uh, from, the, from the scenario completely in a moment. But first, uh, back to Yusuf Erem in Istanbul for uh, some comments on what Yavuz was saying there. Um, basically, Yusuf, uh, Erdogan overreaching, it seems, um, having a, an almost expansionist, certainly cultural um, policy. Uh, foreign policy, uh, but this militarization of the state as well, pushing things towards uh, conflict. Uh, basically, Erdogan's got it wrong. Well, first of all, any time a country projects power, it first projects power in its region. And I know a lot of uh, Western journalists love to use the word neo-Ottoman, but uh, there is no grand neo-Ottoman design. Uh, Turkey, just like any country, is projecting power in its uh, in its region, and that's what it's doing. But uh, Turkey being, or Ankara being pro-war in Azerbaijan, that's definitely not the case. Turkey wants a permanent solution, not a temporary solution, not a refreeze of the conflict where it's going to boil over again in another two, three years as it has over the past 30. Uh, we've to, seen, to be fair, uh, Erdogan's OSD language is ministry. militaristic, isn't it? To be fair, his language well, is... Erdogan it's, it's... wants a permanent solution, and every time he comments on this, he, t he stresses that either UN, resolution UN Security Council resolutions need to be enforced or Armenian troops need to evacuate this area. And I think that's a very reasonable uh, demand. Right, there's an occupation. What does a ceasefire do? It just upholds the status quo. We've had eight or nine ceasefires over 30 years, and there's still fighting going on. There needs to be a permanent solution. Turkey wants to see its borders stable. It wants to see stable borders in Syria, Iraq, and Armenia and Azerbaijan. When the area is destabilized, this hurts Turkey. Turkey doesn't want to have constant war on its borders. No country does. Here no you're saying completely. Here when you're saying it, completely. When there's chaos in the region. Yusuf, let me stop you there. The link is breaking up again. We'll try to reestablish it in a better way. Uh, Yusuf Erim there from uh, TRT World, Turkey analyst, as we heard there with an assessment and another angle on this. Uh, just a thought, 1989, uh, before uh, the uh, breaking up or before the, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh, the uh, population was 67% uh, Armenian. It's a clear majority there, uh, clearly for what was happening and what they wanted. Uh, again, we've, we've talked, Jean, you and I, about this issue of having a place within a country and, of course, belonging to a different country. It's clearly going to cause issues which are clearly difficult to resolve, which is why there's been this constant state of various flare-ups of conflict. Um, we've talked about Russia, we've talked about Turkey. The United States, part of the Minsk group, but in many ways absent on this. Is that one of the problems that the US in withdrawing from the international scene as it is, and Donald Trump sort of like really sort of not hammering that nail home, is this causing problems, leaving a vacuum for other states to act, and I'll say Turkey, act in a way that is really within their own interests rather than the, the greater interests? Well, up to now, it's not a problem. Everybody knows that the United States uh, are uh, in the middle of their campaign, and uh, and it will take some time before they, they, they come back. Um, but I think the diplomacy exists even without a president. And um, the American diplomacy is uh, well balanced on this problem. And as uh, Mr. Baida aptly said, uh, I think uh, they, they are part, as France has sort of wall against some excess from Turkey, uh, but I would add uh, one thing which is important. Um, everybody should know that the Azer Azerbaijanese government, Mr. Aliyev, the president, can't get along with the status quo. It's not possible. And uh, all, all the more that uh, the legitimacy of the Aliyev dynasty is linked to the Nagorno-Karabakh problem. He has to deliver. That's why I think the Azerbaijanis will gain some kind of advantage 
They will negotiate it, and at that moment, they will drop Turkey. So basically, you're, you're saying that Aliyev, the uh, Azeri president, is under pressure to yes. actually deliver on this issue. It's a yes. big issue at home. He needs Internal to deliver on this. Pressure, yes. This is why this is happening. Yes. And it, from 1988 to now, every five years, four years, you had a big clash and even an all-out war in uh, uh, 2016. And now it's an all-out war. And as long as you have no solution, you will have such wars. So, And given the pressure you've just talked about for these areas, I imagine for the Armenians, there is the same kind of issue. Can I bring back in uh, Richard uh, Girigosian from the uh, Regional Studies Centre in Yerevan? I'll put it to you, sir, or maybe you can clarify for us. D does the Armenian government have the same kind of pressure to make sure that Nagorno-Karabakh remains uh, as it is or reintegrates further into Armenia? Is the same kind of political pressure that? Well, yes. Let me start with the bad news. The attacks on the civilian population in Nagorno-Karabakh, well beyond the pale, well beyond the acceptable, has fostered a, a more deeply entrenched position of victimhood, victimization. Memories of the Armenian genocide issue, for example, are now much more firmly entrenched. At the same time, this makes the political dynamic even more difficult. But I agree very much with the ambassador's point. As an analyst, I'm more concerned about President Aliyev's condition, his vulnerability. He's riding the tiger in a risky, dangerous gamble on war and conflict. Every leader of Azerbaijan before President Aliyev has either come to power or has been removed from power only because of events in Nagorno-Karabakh on the battlefield. It's very risky, very dangerous. At the same time, I further agree with the ambassador. Once we return to the negotiation, Azerbaijan needs a face-saving way to let go of Nagorno-Karabakh and concessions and compromise must be mutual. The territories outside of the borders of Nagorno-Karabakh are the only bargaining chips that Armenia and Karabakh can offer. This is pretty much the end state. Getting to the end state has been and is the problem. This is why even Yusuf has a good point. The status quo is untenable for everyone. Everyone is losing except Russia. This conflict gives Russia the leverage and the power over both Armenia and Azerbaijan. And for a final way out, we need actually a situation, in the words of the Armenian prime minister, that's equally acceptable to Armenia, Karabakh, and Azerbaijan. This is why everyone has to lose and everyone has to win in a mutual round of concession and compromise. Otherwise, this is a race to the bottom, and the only beneficiary is Russia. And as a former American government official, my experience shows that the U.S. disengagement, the withdrawal from this region by the U.S., has created a dangerous factor. And in many ways, Russia is much more the key actor, and Turkey is the disruptor, or as Yavuz was pointing to, uh, adding a degree of dangerous and destructive militarization. But the only way out is a face-saving way of concession and compromise. But to get there, the immediacy, the imperative is a ceasefire now. Too many people are paying too high of a price on each side of these borders. Indeed, ceasefire again, Richard. The message coming through loud and clear. Let's go back to Yusuf Erem in Istanbul. We're running out of time quickly, Yusuf. So if you can be brief, I'd appreciate it because I want to get some more comments in before the end. But say what you need to say, sir. Uh, can Turkey help this happen, or is Turkey going to continue, as I think we're saying here, be a disruptor and a problem? As I was saying before, Turkey is very interested in a permanent solution. The last thing it wants to see is this conflict 
frozen and then uh, reheated again in a couple of years. And this seems like a very good opportunity to be able to push for a permanent solution. Now, does a permanent solution mean Azerbaijan's going to get all of its territory back? Who knows? That'll be discussed hopefully at the diplomatic table. But if this diplomatic table will not be formed in a proper way, it looks like Azerbaijan does have the means to make it a military solution as well. And if, that, if that's the case, Turkey will end up supporting it in that aspect as well. But regardless, a permanent solution, and I stress this very many times, a lot of people are talking about a ceasefire. That's just preserving the status quo. That's an Armenian victory. That's an Azerbaijani loss. Yes, a win and a loss, unfortunately. I don't want to talk about it like that because people are dying. But at the end of the day, this is a 30-year conflict, and somebody needs to resolve this. This can't remain a bleeding wound of the region because these types of conflicts have a tendency to further destabilize the region as well. It's communicable. So this is a perfect opportunity to solve this, hopefully, this will be a resolution. Maybe the Minsk group now can finally uh, actually have an enforceable resolution because we've seen them for 30 years basically do nothing, unfortunately, besides in the early years broker a ceasefire to the six-year war. Uh, I think Turkey is a very important actor in this case. Turkey can provide diplomatic solutions. We've seen Yusuf Turkey Aram, I need to cut you off there. Syria. Time is against us, sir. Yes, Thank you very much indeed. Yusuf Aram, the Turkey analyst from TRT World. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks to our other guests as well. Yavuz Beda of Aval News. Uh, to uh, uh, Richard Yerigozian from the Regional Studies Centre in Yerevan. And to my guest here in studio, the former French ambassador in Russia, head of research at Iris and author of Geopolitics of Russia, Jean de Gliasti. Thank you so very much for joining us. And thanks to you for watching too. This is the France 24 debate. Stay with us.